Hey guys, this is Zachariah Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. Now, before we get into today's content, I need a favor to ask you guys. Many of you know that I have a second channel and a co-host named Charlie, who many of you are also quite familiar with through streams and whatever else. He's a really good guy. Anyway, as sort of a test for the second channel, while I was doing Star Wars Squadrons videos, he spent like 50 hours putting together a super cool video on all of the secrets and legends behind Mario 64 including the recently discovered Luigi, who was actually found in the source code, which was leaked yesterday. Unfortunately, the video doesn't really have the legs that we were hoping, and he just went to sleep after staying awake for like 30 hours, so I was hoping you guys could help me and check the video out if it's at all something that you're interested in. I'll put a link in the upper right-hand corner and down in the description. Right now, it's at about 2,000 views. Let's see how high we can get it. Anyway, have you ever noticed that Star Wars fighters just really don't make a whole lot of sense? I mean, specifically, how they fly in, for example, a vacuum. Now, I'm not a physicist, I know very little about physics, so I'm gonna rely on the Wikipedia page here to kind of express what a lot of us sort of innately realize. Unlike the true flight dynamics of space, those seen in Star Wars closely mirror the flight dynamics of flying in Earth's atmosphere. In the airless vacuum of Star Wars, the spaceships always unnecessarily bank when turning. And I mean, that's just one example. Another would be the fact that ships seem to always need to maintain some some constant thrust to continue moving, while in a true vacuum you'd really just constantly accelerate with additional thrust. Once you're moving in a vacuum, there's nothing that will slow you down, but that's not really the case in Star Wars. We see smooth turns and drifts which just shouldn't be possible in a vacuum, and even sound propagates through vacuum, although some Star Wars media has explained this as being in effect within the cockpit itself, sort of generating battle noise to help the pilot. There other examples which we'll come back to in a minute, but just generally, if you're not interested in the lore behind this, that's totally fine, because Star Wars as a universe is generally defined by what looks coolest and is internally consistent. So Star Wars starfighters fly the way they do because they're meant to be a callback to the aircraft of World War 1 and 2. But if you want to actually get into the lore explanation, there are some that have been developed by the expanded universe, which I think do make sense. To turn back quickly for a moment though to aspects of space combat that exist in Star Wars which aren't realistic when considering a vacuum, we see that projectiles, for instance, are almost never used. We see that battles take place at extremely close ranges, the turbo lasers use their heat very, very quickly, and that explosions are probably more substantial than we would expect. Although, again, I'm a guy who talks about Star Wars for a living, I know very, very little about real science, unsurprisingly. So what's the explanation? Well, there was a really phenomenal post on one of my favorite Star Wars subreddits, actually scratched that my favorite Star Wars subreddit, the Maw installation, which had a detailed explanation for what the author called the unusual physics of Star Wars. And I know what a lot of you guys are going to say, well, Star Wars takes place in the same universe as ours, that's what the title crawl says anyway, we're just in a different galaxy at a different time. And while that may be true, clearly there's something funky going on because the Star Wars universe does not display the same physical properties as our universe. Despite from what we're talking about in today's video, there's the fact that aside from some pretty obscure EU references, relativity is never a thing in Star Wars, despite the fact that the characters very frequently travel near black holes or travel very, very fast. And it would be interesting to see how hyperspace would deal with issues of relativity. The EU did have something called relativistic shielding, but Pablo Hidalgo has also said that no, that just doesn't exist in Star Wars, so it's not something worth thinking about, which truly does make the story a lot easier for everyone involved. Had relativity been a thing, Dala would have had a much longer wait at the Maw installation. Anyway, back on topic, the author of the aforementioned Maw installation post explains that physics in the Star Wars universe are different because the vacuum is made up of a luminiferous ether. And for those who don't know, which was probably most of you, including myself, but for Star Wars, a luminous ether was basically an idea which would explain how light traveled through a vacuum. Sound, for example, needs to travel through a medium. It can't travel through pure vacuum, and it was thought that because light is a wave, it would need something similar, and luminiferous ether was that something. The exact nature of the luminiferous ether isn't really important. What is is the fact that it changes the vacuum such that it is filled by something, and it is this something, this luminiferous ether, or whatever it is in the Star Wars universe, that makes it so ships fly in this unique and not realistic, at least to our universe, way. This maintains all of the elements of 
of a vacuum which are important to the Star Wars universe. It doesn't contain air, for example. It's not an atmosphere or anything like that. You can die if you're thrown out into a vacuum. Fundamentally, it doesn't change the common elements of outer space that most people understand when watching movies, but it does interact with spaceships in a way that makes them fly like they're going through atmosphere or even water. So this was just a phenomenal post by Sticklefront. It was one which used, albeit outdated, real-world physics to suggest an explanation to the Star Wars universe. Really the best type of post within the Maw installation. But there's more than that. I bet you there's at least one person who's a big fan of the Star Wars X-Wing books by Michael Stackpole and Aaron Alston, who was just listening to my explanation and had their ears perk up. And that's because starships in that series and in other books have a component called an etheric rudder, which allows them to perform maneuvers in space. And this ties in perfectly with the theory. The etheric rudder is used to help Star Wars ships maneuver through this ether and just generally the vacuum that's a little bit different in Star Wars. In the real world in outer space, a rudder is not going to do anything. It's got nothing to interact with. However, if you imagine outer space in the Star Wars universe to be a sort of atmosphere or even like a water, then it makes sense how a rudder would help with turning, for instance. Timothy Zahn was fundamental in establishing how the Star Wars Wars literary expanded universe worked, especially Star Wars Legends. He was actually the first one to use the term etheric runner, and the instance of its use in Heir to the Empire really well illustrates what we're talking about here. The TIE Fighters launched, accelerating away from the Chimera and then leaning hard into etheric rudders to sweep back around it like the spray of some exotic fountain. So these rudders, which are working very much like you would expect them to work on a boat, are helping the ships turn in this instance. The use is basically the same in the X-Wing novels, and here Here's a quote from Rogue Squadron. Corrin snapped a shot off at one starfighter and watched it disintegrate. A warning warble from Whistler and he mashed his right foot down on the etheric rudder pedal. The X-Wing's stern slew around to the left, swinging him out of an interceptor's line of fire while pointing his nose right at the ship as it sailed past him. So Star Wars does have some form of ether. We're not going to find out more than that. Just know that the vacuum is not the same as it is in our universe and that's why things are behaving so strangely and why space paddles are so cool. Unfortunately, this explanation hasn't been brought over to Star Wars canon yet, at least to my knowledge. However, having played Star Wars Squadrons, the effect of the ether is undeniable, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some reference in the game somewhere. And a really good example of a maneuver possible in ether is probably my favorite in the game. You fly at full speed, you immediately cut your engines, which allows you to stop, and while you're doing that, you can drift, turn around and fire on your enemy, or pull off very quick turns. Now, if you cut your engines in a vacuum, that doesn't happen. You just continue moving at your same speed. All right, so today's hashtag ask at question comes from the highway man who asks, what if the invisible hand escaped? The invisible hand is the very subtly named capital ship used by Grievous and Dooku during the Battle of Coruscant. It was the one which captured Chancellor Palpatine. And I think if that ship escaped alongside Palpatine, so long as Anakin wasn't killed, the plan would have just continued as normal. Grievous wasn't totally privy to Palpatine's plan although Dooku was. Grievous didn't know that Palpatine and Sidious were the same person, for example, but he was under strict orders not to kill the Chancellor, and of course, Palpatine wouldn't have let him anyway. So the plan would have continued to be to lure Anakin into a spot where Palpatine can continue to break down his sort of light side barriers, get him to do something evil, maybe have him see the death of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Whether that happens over Coruscant or somewhere else probably isn't super important, and we also know that Palpatine basically planned the Battle of Coruscant to make the Republic seem vulnerable to help encourage further militarization. If the Chancellor was not only captured, but actually taken away from the capital, that would be even more dramatic and even more frightening, so I think his plan would have continued to work out just as well. That, however, is just my opinion. Let me know what you think. And just generally, I would love any comments they have on this video, any ask at questions you'd like me to answer in the future. And if you enjoyed this video, and if you've been enjoying my content for the past three years, Years, do me a favor, go check out that Mario video. I'm calling in a favor. Until then, though, guys, have a good one. As always, be safe and may the force be with you.